Hello, everyone. I'm Sin from Art Science Museum. Thank you for joining us this afternoon in our Learning from Home Roundtable. This event forms part of a broader suite of Art Science at Home program, which has found a new home on our online platforms since April. It has marked a new expression for how the museum brings stories and experiences to our audiences and the broader community. For you to experience virtual tours, talks, performances, screenings, and workshops from the comfort of your homes during a period where COVID-19 is affecting arts and cultural institutions around the world. Art Science at Home is a significant part of our work in which we continue to nurture new forms of invention in different kinds of space. I'm joined by five panelists today for a roundtable discussion where we will be talking about some of the personal narratives and experiences of learning from home during lockdown but also how this period of disruption is presenting opportunities to respond to new perspectives on parenting, teaching, and learning beyond the pandemic. We have been seeding this idea for this conversation when we hosted an online talk by Sharo Chong, a strategic foresight practitioner and educator specializing in public policy as part of our Feeling the Future series in which we discussed and imagined new futures in a world where uncertainty and anxiety is prevalent. And in her talk, Cheryl discussed why it is important to democratize tools for hope and impart them to young people, something which struck a chord with our audiences. Particularly during the Q&A, there were urgent questions and comments coming in about the existential moments that many educators and parents are facing during this time. So today's roundtable discussion is very much a follow-up to the signposts from Cheryl's talk to further the engagement with this topic. And I'm delighted to be joined by Zenvin Kang, Principal Clinical Psychologist at Psych Connect, Bob Lee, Photographer and Autism Advocate, Cheryl Lim Zeng, Editor with the Birthday Collective, Victor Lim, Assistant Professor at NIE, and Elaine Ng, Co-Founder of The Learning Connections. We will be hearing from them how the learning experience is being shaped in home environments during this period, as well as how they have been working in inventive, collaborative ways to bring the best out of these times. So we're live streaming on both YouTube and Facebook and would love to hear your thoughts, comments or questions throughout the session this afternoon. Please do share them with us. We're starting first with a moderator conversation for the earlier part of the program and we'll be taking questions from the floor in the second half. And if you have any questions for the panelists or specific to any one of the speakers, please drop them in the chat boxes and we would be very happy to cover them in the discussion today. So at this point, I'd like to welcome our panelists for introductions. Hello. Hi. Hi, Zenvin, Bob, Sherry, Victor, and Elaine. Um, thank you so much for making time to take part in this program. It's such a pleasure having all of you for this afternoon's conversation. And before we get started, I'd love to just go around the table and have everyone introduce yourselves to share about your background and what you do. And maybe we can start with Victor, who's right next to me. All right. Um, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm Victor. I teach and research on multiliteracies and language education at the National Institute of Education. I'm a parent of three primary school going children, and um, many of my research interests have been inspired by my interactions and reflections with my kids. I was previously a teacher in a junior college and spent some time in the Ministry of Education headquarters looking at technologies for learning before I joined academia. Thank you, Victor. What about you, Sanvin? Hi, everyone. My name is Sanvin. Um, I'm a clinical psychologist by training and also the founder of PsychConnect. And um, PsychConnect is a psychology clinic, but we specialize working mostly with children, adolescents, and their families. Um, we are a multidisciplinary team. So, um, you know, uh, speech therapists, occupational therapists, educational therapists, and psychologists, um, which form our child development services. Right, thank you, Bob. Okay, um, hmm. hi, uh, I'm Bob, a uh, photographer from the company called The Fat Farmer. That's my company. And then um, I have a son with autism. Uh, he's 13 years old right now. Yeah, that's all. Right, thank you for introducing Jinla in your introduction yeah. as well. Um, hi, Sherry, what about you? Um, you're on mute, Sherry, if you could just unmute you. Hi, 
Thanks for having me. Um, I'm editor with the Birthday Collective, and we created a whole space for uncomfortable conversations to be had um, about Singapore, for Singapore, and I, I think uh, the, the things that really matter to us. I am, uh, uh, and in my day job, I do tech and I do education. Um, and I Thank have you, sons. Elaine. Hi, everyone. I'm Elaine. Um, I've been an early childhood um, practitioner for more than 25 years, and I co-founded the Learning Connections TLC in short with uh, my best friend, Juliet, who's online now somewhere, in 2009. Um, both of us share the same belief that the arts are imperative to the well-being of individuals, education and communities, and it should really start from the very young. So we use a lot of process-driven drama and theatre approaches across all our programs, from um, drama education programs in preschools to theatre for young audience and professional development courses for teachers, museum educators and families. Um, I'm also an associate lecturer with the National Institute of Early Childhood Development and Singapore University of Social Sciences, currently pursuing my PhD study, looking at how the use of dramatic and playful pedagogies can engage kindergarten children as active global citizens in Singapore. Thank you so much for sharing about your backgrounds and your interests. Um, I'd like to maybe begin by asking how all of you are doing. Um, a really broad, broad question about how have the days been like for you during this period? Well, I guess I'm, I'm doing well, uh, mostly. Um, yes, in about half a year uh, of us living with the pandemic, and I think we have mostly settled into new ways of working, new ways of playing. And um, I guess as a family, we are also appreciating the time we have at home uh, with one another. So that's nice. Mm. And, um, I, like it, I, I like it much better now that home-based learning is over. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very upfront. <laughs> Right. Well, we're gonna we're gonna circle back to you, Sherry, because you've been doing very interesting experiments in your home environment, and we'll come back to to that later and expand upon that. Um, yeah. What about you, Bob? Mm, I think during the whole period, I mean, uh, I mean, I have a son with uh, special needs, and and when, when the school school is in the normal days, of course, uh, half we have a half a day break. Uh, but when when the circuit breaker start until phase one, phase two, it's like oh, you need to see him twenty four seven every day. Of course, my son is cute, but it's like, oh, you, you, you don't want to see and look at this guy uh, for 24-7. But yeah, but at least now the school is back to normal. I think that's a good thing. So. <laughs> right, relishing the moment like Sherry as well. Um, Elaine, what about you? I know your children are a little bit more grown up um, than the rest of them, than their 20s, right? Yeah, they are both grown ups in their 20s. So I have a 26 and a 21 year old daughter or just turned 22 in fact. Mm. So I'm good generally um, adapting to this new way of living, I guess. Um, it really feels as if I've gone on a long sailing trip with my colleagues and family. So in the day, we were like riding through different storms and in the evening, we will have nice warm meals together in a calm sea, chatting about <laughs> our day's experiences and also taking the time to kind of, you know, learn what other people are doing during this pandemic period, you know. Yeah, so then what about you? I mean, the last time we spoke, you have been working from home, yeah? But you have a three-year-old daughter as well. Oh, no, so I don't have any children. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> but oh, well, thanks but, for that. Maybe sorry. soon if you do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, um, I, was, I was working from home. Um, it, it was an interesting time for us. We, um, well, I guess it was half and half. We were, we were working from home and, and if there was... Um, an individual who was not suited for home-based therapy, we were given permission to go into the clinic. So it was an interesting juggling act, I have to say. Mm. Um, we're back in the clinic now, but it has been um, it has been an interesting journey, both as a as a clinician and and as an individual, um, seeing how uh, resilient human beings are and how quickly people adjusted and 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 how quickly we're adjusting back because you know every phase comes with massive changes, and I think um, it has been simply put <laughs> quite a journey yeah, yeah i mean just to chime in with what Sanvin is sharing um about every one of us being impacted in a myriad of ways by COVID 19 and the restrictions that are relating to it because no one is exempt um and we have had our routines appended by the outbreak um we've had to adapt to really the shifting tide of changes across all aspects of our lives um so i'm just wondering what has been um you know the hardest part of um the circuit breaker for your families what have you found to be be um, the most difficult adjustment that you have had to make? 
Mm, is it, is it for me, um, I think for when uh, teaching my son uh, to understand what is circuit breaker, because uh, special needs, uh, especially autism, is very rigid to certain routine. Yeah. You wake up, go to school, and then come back. And then only weekends is, uh, uh, is the uh, break time and school holidays. I don't want one week. The March is one week holidays, right? During the March holiday, and then suddenly this circuit breaker come and then he, to him it's like why why there's no school again then you just start the whole routine again to introduce a lot of things to him i think that's the hardest part uh, during the whole the whole period to let him understand what circuit breaker and then uh after he he get uh understand the routine about the circuit breaker then suddenly the school open again and to mm. let, under, let him understand again why 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 is those change it's not school holiday but then now it's school now you're not going to school but now you need to go back to school there are a lot of changes that you need to adapt then that's the things that we, i think for, for us is the hardest part yeah you have some really wonderful stories to share and i'll come back to you um again bob um but what about the rest of you, rest of you i mean sherry how about you what's been the most um what's been the hardest thing for you and your family um, I was just talking to a friend yesterday about it, actually, and I think the moving goalposts, like every time we think we're mm. hitting some sort of a, a groove, right? We have like a routine and then things change again. Um, and I think that that kind of, for me, that that cycle, it's, it's quite exhausting only yeah. because I think we always try and find a, a kind of like a rhythm uh, to keep the family going um, to a point that now I've pretty much given up and like, okay, you know what, we could, we could be phase three tomorrow, we could be back in lockdown tomorrow. So we just kind of take each week as it comes and uh, we, we steal time away as a family. We can go, we like to go to nature parks, right? So we go out, we walk. Um, and when we can do that, we do that. Um, and then there are days where it's raining, we can't, we stay in. And I remind the kids, you know, we have weathered two months of real lockdown. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's probably never going to be as bad, hopefully. Um, you know, and we, we just try and just get through it today. Like, but for me, the hardest really is just keeping everyone on course because exams are still going to happen. You know, contracts are still going to be made, meetings still happen, um, groceries need to be bought, you know, things like that. And so just to keep the, the household going on top of the company, that for me is a, a real struggle. Uh, speaking about exams, um, Victor, your eldest kid is going through PSLE this year. Um, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, you have three kids as well. Do you share the same experience that um, Sherry has been talking about? Yes, like I sort of improvising and, and, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis? Yes, yes, making things up as we go along. I think um, what I was uh, mentioned earlier, I think the HPR was um, was challenging. I think many of us have a newfound regard and appreciation for teachers. So we, we just have to adapt and, and, and make do the best that we, we know how with um, with uh, whatever time and attention we can give to the to, to our child. I, I think um, if you think about the hardest part of the circuit breaker, for me, uh, it was really a reminder of the things that we cannot do because of the mm. restriction. That, that is really yeah. the hardest. It's like yeah. uh, when we want to be compressed by going out uh, for a stroll in the park without covering on our mouth, we can't do that. Um, it's like having people over our, our, our place for, for dinner. Or recently, my grandfather just had his 89th birthday celebration. We wanted to have a family reunion and we realized, no, we can't. We, we can only have um, you know groups of five. I think in the end, he was happy because he had more celebrations than one. But, but nonetheless, the, the, <laughs> The idea of uh, everybody coming together for our gathering or even going to church is something that we miss. Um, yeah, so I, I think the hardest part is really the reminder of what mm. you cannot do and things that you yeah. used to do and you enjoy, and you take for granted. So, so that was tough, I think. Yeah, Savin, what about you? Yeah, for me, it was, it was you know, kind of like Victor said, um, the connectivity, um, family connections and being able to, I have a very big family and, and mm. we love getting together and given um, any opportunity, we would like to come together, grandparents, uncles, aunts, cousins, and not being able to do that, um, not being able to do that without counting and seeing whether we've exceeded the limit. Yeah. Um, that's, I think that for me was the hardest, um, having to schedule in um, things that were so automatic. Um, and and Lee, yeah. Elaine, you have a very interesting, um, share, uh, you were sharing something very interesting about your family. You know, your girls are, are, are really all grown up. Um, and then you were talking to us a little bit about um, the, the sort of unexpected togetherness um, that's really come into your life since Circuit Breaker began. Yeah, I guess for me, um, Homegrown is fine because the children are all grown up. But being in the same space at home with uh, with my family is really that safe and comforting feeling. Um, 
we because they are, we are, they are all so grown up right so we 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 all have our own lives to 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 lead even though we are in the same space so we are each in our own tiny corner doing our work but we are very much aware of each other's presence so we mm-hmm. know at some point we will ask one another hey what would you like to eat uh you know every day uh, don't know what to eat should we order from food panda or should we order from deliveroo yeah. and then you know sometimes you say you know i feel like bubble tea you know do you want and knowing that we can go to each other when we need advice within the same space it was nice my most memorable experience really is uh, getting to try different food recipes from them you know <laughs> i suddenly realized that not only my elder girl can bake and cook my younger one is pretty good too right um um just now victor was sharing about how the pandemic has radically changed our lived everyday experience and um, make him long for you know the moments of normalcy that we all felt um that we had taken so much for granted are there these moments of normalcy that the rest of you feel nostalgic for <laughs> one of the things i did during circuit breaker um was i had rezoned my house i mean i'm quite fortunate to live in a, a house with a couple of floors so my what I gave my kids free reign to do was they could label each space a different thing. So the yeah. garden was Sentosa. Our study room was one day it was the school they were at or Starbucks, you know things like that. So every day it felt like we we're going to work in a different place or we we're going to, to to school in a different place. And like dinner place was a country flag because depending on what we were having, what, what depending on what we were having, um, uh, it would be like Korea or Japan, sometimes Italy. So I think we kind of kept up this sometimes we find fun and humor in, mm. in small places um and that that helped us get through it just uh every day waking up to see where the garden would be you know uh, like a, like it's almost like traveling but you don't know where you're going so that that for us helped us a lot and you're very democratic about it as well right the kids get to decide yeah i figured you no know, in real life i decide where to go for holidays because we're paying the bills but you know during the breaker if you want to go to like paris for lunch sure does it really matter to me yeah i mean bob what about you what do you missed about you know the life just a couple of months back um hmm let me think in fact in fact uh for us uh so we we spent i mean the thing we spent even be, before circuit breaker or during circuit breaker, we, we spent almost 24 7 with my son huh? mm-hmm. so we, we do a lot of things from jogging to, to to cooking i mean of course during the circuit breaker one, one of the things that we do is we, we make noodles uh, make our own noodles uh, because everyone making bread breads right and bread so yeah remember the good cakes so we don't do cakes next make noodles so you put the powder right? So it, it, it occupied him like one one or two hours to to to, to come out the, the noodles so we can cook the food. So I think the whole process is really good. Uh. And also, uh, in fact, uh, he, he my son my son is thirteen years old, but he's a uh, seventy kg. That's quite 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 uh, big size. But during the the whole few months, in fact, he lose he lose about four kg. So sixty six now. And uh, because we ask him to go go jog, jogging around the the house. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think that's a good thing that they really train him become a new routine for him. That's good thing, sir. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's nice to hear that, um, you know, COVID-19 circuit breaker has given this brief insight into a slower pace of life. And um, these are some of the satisfactions that aren't really defined in market terms. Um, I'm curious if, you know, for the rest of you, there have been sort of the unexpected positives as well. Elaine, what about you? Uh, I guess for me, I used to live um, a very hectic lifestyle in the pre-COVID time, you know, traveling from meeting to meeting, school to school to observe classes, teaching in the night. I, I didn't have much time to to think and reflect for myself. So when COVID happened, everything slowed down massively. I was at a loss at first, but then I started to really appreciate the time and space to be able to to breathe and just think deeply about my work and life. Um, and one thing I have truly missed, though, is being able to meet my faculty in person mm. um, to not just talk about work, but just be in the same space, eating together and have a good laugh in the same space. That's what I really missed. Yeah, Sanvin, how about you? Yeah, um, I was, I, I guess I was thinking on, for, for me, it was um, COVID taught me the lesson that we don't need to control very much of our lives. We, you know, we, we spend a big part of our lives planning and 
thinking about what we're going to do today and tomorrow. And, and that was the one thing COVID took away, which was there were no plans. Um, mm. And uh, being able to um, live it very little even, um, if you think about not being able to go out to eat or not being able to do very much, but still be quite fulfilled with, with what we had within our homes without the noise of the world. Yeah, yeah um, Victor. Well, for me, I, I I guess one of the greatest takeaway from this period of time is that I learned how to play, and I learned to. <laughs> I mean, I, I learned to reflect on pl um, learning as play and play as learning. Now, in the early days at home, um, you know, when when HBL started, uh, we tried to have a structure to have some sense of to to maintain some sanity, right? To, to have a routine, including H, um, H, uh, HBL, and then we put yeah. in play time for the day as well. And when we intentionally structure in play time, which we term family time, I guess um, we all had to commit to it. So me and my wife, we have to put outside our work, our social media, our distraction. And, and in, the, in the two hours that we uh, set aside for play, we played games together, board games, digital games. And, and it became something that the children look forward to. And I think it helped the adults to decompress as well during that period of time. So that was wonderful. Um, since we're on this topic, Victor, I was wondering if you might want to share about the work that you have been doing around parents co-play with children. I understand a big part of your research interest is looking at how and what we teach learners in today's digital age, um, and also how parents can connect more deeply with their children um, through different kinds of learning and play. Yeah, so maybe I'll, I'll share a little bit. I think um, a lot of my research, as I mentioned earlier, is very much inspired by my interactions and my reflections with my kids. Um, and, and one of the areas that, um, that I'm looking at and thinking about a little bit more now is in the area of digital play. We know that children learn as they play, and more importantly, in play, they also learn how to learn. So, of course, co-play can be non-digital or digital. And, and the kind of digital play that I mentioned that I participate with my kids is is um, joining them as one of the avatars on the multiplayer online games or Roblox. And, and through that, I thought, hmm, there are some interesting observations that I have made as I participate in this, um, in this experience with them. Um, I, I think one of the things um, that we, we benefit really is that we show children that we value uh, their interests and we would like to be a part of their world because they are naturally very interested in this um, digital games. And when we begin to participate, initially they're surprised. After that, they really appreciate that kind of bonding that we have. Uh, we learn the language of the games and then we are able to use the language to speak to them uh, about the, so I'm playing Battle Cats now with my second boy, uh, who is an avid gamer now. And, <laughs> and, and uh, our cats that we have, you know, how can we uh, evolve our cats to fight with us? And that's interesting. So so I thought that was that was rich. And I also reflected on the experience and I felt that playing with our children can be a humbling experience uh, for us as well, because this is the time where the kids became become the experts you know, they, they tell us what are the things we, we should do. They guide us in playing the games. And I feel that it, through that, they get to build their confidence and self-esteem as well. And as I play with them, and me and my wife observe the way they, they play, the way they make certain decisions. And I think it is revealing of their character. And I think um, we, we learn a little bit more about them as we watch them play and we play with them. Um, on the other note, we also realize that it's also revealing of our characters as well because we noticed that our children will also watch our behavior and mm -hmm. hopefully the positive one. So how we respond when we lose in the game, the values we use to make decisions. You know? So I think it's really in that kind of participation with our children rather than our exhortation or our nagging that we can role model positive cyber wellness practices with our, with our kids. So, um, and I think in, you have an image to share with us as well, yeah? If we could yeah. just pull it up and quickly show everyone how Victor and his family are like as avatars. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is one of the games. Now, yeah. of course, we recognize that there are legitimate concerns over, over screen time and gaming addiction, but I think uh, it's important for us not to throw the baby out with the bathwater because digital play can offer opportunities for learning. So one of the things that I've been doing with my, uh, in a project is uh, how can we uh, support caregivers when they engage with digital play with young children, the use of ed uh, educational apps. So one recent output from my project is the creation of a deck of cards as conversational prompts between caregivers and young children and the use of various educational apps for learning. I think the, the cards uh, is shown on the screen. I have a deck of cards here. Oh, okay. So we talk about uh, different types of learning, such as language learning, social emotional learning, values, and we create questions guided by a framework that caregivers can use when they talk to their children using the app. 
So we have a website, ideas and resources that is continually populated as well. I think at the end of the day, um, I, I just want to bring across this message that we, we tend to, as parents, we tend to be anxious over what we do not know. So, so we can get to know their world, understand how gamification is designed to be addictive, model positive behavior, responsibly used for our kids. And then we can use digital play as a way to bond and communicate with our kids. So, mm. so that's you essentially. Yeah. Um, if 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 we could just if I could just talk about the sort of sense of agency um that you're nurturing um with with kids and, and bringing parents in, into this process of play, um and um Sherry what you were talking just now also about you know having very playful zones about around the house to encourage them to really experiment um and to step out of their comfort zones and maybe to be a little bit more creative about the sort of day to day, um, I'm I'm just wondering um. Is there a do do you all feel that there's an intentional sense of need to establish this normalcy in your home so that you can have some form of togetherness? Was it intended, or was it some was it something that you talk about as a family? Was it something that was um you know parents taking maybe the lead, for instance? I think for me it was about not making not raising the anxiety level. Mm -hmm. um, I think during COVID, as an adult, when you read newspapers, you you know, work, what's yeah. changing, there's all these things you deal with. There's a sense of, I think, for me, it was a basal level of anxiety. I mean, I think I managed my anxiety levels quite well, but I didn't want it to spill over to my kids because I think the moment I panic, they would panic too. Yeah. Uh, having, having said that, so I think at the beginning, there was a lot of that, me just trying to keep it together and then finding ways to ease them into this this new normal, right? I mean, I hate that phrase, but that's what it is. Mm -hmm. And I think later on, as we as things kind of dragged on and they saw that we were struggling too, just coping with work, coping with them and HBL, coping with their needs, our needs, not going out, for example, uh, worrying about, you know, grandparents, things like that. I think it was, it was actually healthy for them to see us struggle mm -hmm. because, I mean, firstly, parenting is a struggle anyway, right? On any given day. But I think that they also see us struggle. They see that they are internal struggles and they do still struggle and worry and have anxieties. That's normal too. Yeah. And I think it gave us um, an opportunity to really talk about how it's okay to struggle. It's okay to not be okay. It's okay to be anxious. It's okay to have bad days. It's okay to have, you know, even worse days. Um, and then tomorrow is a new day and we start over again. Um, and I think for us, there was the, re rep the repetition of having new days to restart and be better than the day before was healthy for us. And I think it taught me a lot as a parent that, Today's not great, you know, some days they have a meltdown and then tomorrow, tomorrow's a better day. And then maybe the next day is not so good. But every day there is always something that we take away from. And every night we made it a plan to to say what we're grateful for. And I think mm -hmm. that for me, I mean, I did it more, I mean, of course I say it for my kids, but I think it centered me um, that I could still find moments of gratefulness and things to be happy about and things to be grateful for. Yeah, I mean, speaking about struggles, I think something that Bob was sharing with me that that really stayed with me for the past week was when I was asking him uh, when I was asking um Bob you about you know the, the set of worries that um families with young children are going through especially during the the start of the circuit breaker and we when we were in the thick of it um and and when I was asking you how how was it like for you and Jinla and Hui Hui as a family unit um it must have been a very unique um um set of worries for you and and basically when I asked you you whether you're stressed about it and you said you've been stressed for 13 years <laughs> yeah yeah um because because uh Jinle, uh, my son Jinle, uh, is, uh, his verbal is quite limited so mm -hmm. and sometimes you can't you can't really express uh, through words uh, telling us uh, what happening like sometimes you can cry or ask him uh, why you cry because i'm sad why you sad because i'm crying you know, why you crying because i'm sad then that's the only way they can, can uh, talk to us so but during the circuit breaker started and uh, we're telling him that you, you, you cannot go out uh, you must wear masks, you can do a lot of things. Then he's like, go out, go out, uh, orchard, suntech, or you know, he likes to take leaves and up and down the escalator leaves and all these things. They said, no, we can't go out. So there's one day we decided to, how, how about we, 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 drive, we drive the car, we drove the car and then three of us in the car say, Chin up, let's go to suntech and see, we stay in the car. So when we drove past the suntech, there's no one in, on the street. It's so quiet, you know. And then we, we say, okay, let's go to Orchard Road. Then we go to Orchard Road. There's no one on the street. Then halfway, he say, go home. Go home. You're so scared. He say, go home. Stay home for SG. Stay home for SG. No, thanks. 
it's, it's really grateful that um on televisions and and and, and uh radios and you could get a lot of information about circuit uh, uh covid 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 and also some i think be, even before the school closed and the, the teacher did share with them about the, the some of the some of the website about the covid 19. so he's like he's so scared he said go home stay for home stay home for SG for the past for the the few weeks and months and he refused to go out but af after he understand what these things then he refused to go out that's another, <laughs> another problem for us guys yeah now he don't want to go out until phase two they say uh chilla let's go to uh the shopping mall stay home stay home stay home he was, he was scared. until we pull, I pull him to the shopping mall with, uh, of course wear the mask and they say see uncle buying food chilla mm. buy food mm -hmm. eat eat the food then he was like okay then buy food go go back go back he was so scared but of course we threw uh, a few more uh treats to go out and then he started to realize that, okay it's okay to go out it's okay to some change sometimes stay at home and then he his new phrase is stay home with sg stay home with sg like, they always tell us that you know that he's got very ganjong they must go home and stay home with sg so it's, it's a lot of changes that we need to adapt so like always like okay this like, we must come up a new plan a new visual visual guide or new new audio or whatever. a lot of new things a new strategy to a reward system we have this reward mm. system is um because the the, 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 circuit, the first first time when they announced the circuit record only for like one month so we have this stars reward system at 30 stars then you, you can you can go back to school then after the almost get the 29 stars then the <laughs> pm say extend extend <laughs> the money said how the card is going to finish <laughs> go a few more life you look at the look at the reward card huh more and then the more more stars <laughs> yes more star more star so so in between we give you a like small little treat like oh yeah, if you do this you get like ice cream do this and do this and then you get the things yeah, a lot, of, a lot of these kind of changes and challenges for, for us. Uh, yeah, yeah, very much similar to what Sherry was sharing about the resetting, adapting, <laughs> but then, you know, implementing more things along the way. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, Sherry and I mean, Sherry and Victor, you, you, you have children who are much younger in your families, but also Elaine, you work very closely with your faculty members um, in terms of imparting the drama experience to young kids. Um, how did you did you have to explain what was happening with the COVID nineteen outbreak to them, or, or how did you explain it? Um, when did you find that they um, started becoming quite conscious that this is serious? You know that we must stay at home as much as possible, um, that we must follow the instructions provided by the authorities, and then also how did you approach this conversation with your kids and and talk to them about some of these big pandemic feelings? Um. I, I really appreciate, you know, um, what Sherry, Victor and Bob, you know, were saying about sharing their experiences about, you know, talking with their children. And I think the, the one of the most important thing is we, in the midst of everything, you know, when especially when it's difficult period, we are so caught up with our own anxieties. Sometimes we overlook the, the, the emotions of the young children. And, you know, and, and it is so important to engage them in discussions and conversations to help them make sense of what's actually happening around them with them you know what's what's going on um with us we spent a lot more time trying it, it was our concern really during the circuit breaker there is no way for us to reach out to the children that we were working with you know how do we how do we support the families how do we support the schools um to help the children to understand you know all about this COVID situation and and you know uh why why, why are these seeing certain things so we we a lot of our a lot of um, our home based learning programs actually during the discussion with the children stems from the questions that they ask in class. Why can't I see my friends? Why can't I have birthday celebration in school? Why can't I go and see my grandma? So this became our topics of discussions and the stimuli for us to go through a dr drama narrative with children, helping them to make sense of what's currently happening what they've been observing you know around their environment so it also gives us an opportunity to to design um uh, we actually digitalize a content so we design a, a, a muppet series called singing with zoe so zoe is intentionally being created as a five-year-old child a girl who's very curious about what's happening you know what's circuit breaker you know um now that i cannot i cannot see my friends you know how do i show care you know so, so it's basically drawing questions from children and having this series um, being played on our YouTube channel just to mm. engage children and helping them to make sense of things that's currently happening to them and at home. Uh, we had a lot of conversations internally within our faculty 
We also have time to speak to our parents every time before and at the end of each class just to to hear if they have any concerns you know are there any things that they are struggling especially when during this time when majority of them are working from home and they have their children at home as well so a lot of parents were actually very forthcoming in sharing that you know they 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 forgot how to play for example mm. you know when the children want to play you know make believe how do they engage you know how do they participate how do they go in as co-players with them um, so it's really heartening to see sometimes, you know, you hear parents saying that, you know, I'm really surprised to hear my, ch my, my, my child says this. Um, yeah, so, so it's, it's been a lot of experience with, with me, my work and, you know, working with the teachers and the children in the schools that we've, you know, that we are working with. Right. Um, what about you, Victor? I mean, how did you approach the conversation about COVID-19, um, the outbreak, the circuit breaker with your three kids? Well, I, I think to be honest, I think the, the schools and teachers have done a very good job because they come back home and they are the one that they are reminding me that this, this are the things that you should do, these are the things that you should not do. And I think my wife and right. I are, had, had to balance it off by trying to allay their anxieties a, a little right. bit more. Mm -hmm. so, um, that, that was in that particular context. But in terms of having conversation with my, my kids, I, I found that um, as, as, as we, we uh, talk about just now, my boy is going to PSLE, so it's a particularly... Mm -hmm school year for him uh, because of the COVID, he lost. I mean, he was unable to attend school for a while, and 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 the, the lead up to PSLU was also a little rest, uh, nerve wracking. I, I I found that um having um one to one dates with uh, with my kids really make a difference. So um so rather than do um I, I noticed that it behaves. It's very precious. It behaves differently when me, my wife, and one of them go out together, or me, my wife, and all three of them go out together, and me and my boy go out together for breakfast. I, I, I thought it was very precious. And, and um, I think we had some of our best conversations, you know, father and son talk uh, just over breakfast. And that's something that I, 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 I highly recommend. I think once you create that, um, that environment, we have um, finished eating, we are feeling full and satisfied, and then the conversation starts rolling. And I, I think that was that's something that's, uh, I, I say, very, very precious. Yeah, what about you, Sherry? Um, I think for me, it was, I think the whole COVID has taught me that my kids have far more resilience than I do. Um, I will, I will admit. I know it's been many, many months into this mask wearing. I still hate it. Mm -hmm. When I go out, I try and like I, every now and then I take it out and I clean my face. I feel like I'm sweating into it. And I look at my kids and they they put it on. My 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 almost three year old puts it on. He's like, "Mommy, I need to wear my mask." And he puts it on, and then he goes out. And he have to keep it on all day because I think it's there's something that they've just adapted to. Yeah. And I think there's a, a lot to be learned from that. You know that I think we we don't give kids as much credit as we they, we should. Yeah. They're far yeah. more resilient. They're more adaptable. They're more flexible in many many ways. I think it's adults who kind of hanker for what could be, what could have been, what was. Um, instead of saying and realizing that I think the world as we know it might be entirely different. Um, and I, I mean, I'll, there's still days where I'm like, oh my God, I want to travel. And my kids are like, oh, but we, we can go for a staycation. It's okay. <laughs> um, you know, and sometimes they, they, they teach me. And I think, I think Victor's right. It's the small things that, that we now have a chance to do. Um, I wrote a piece for CNA about how introverts are coping with when phase two happen. And I, I, I likened it to a butterfly kind of struggling to get out. And I think for me, it's it's still true. Um, I still, I'm still finding my groove and trying to, you know, go out with my friends again or, you know, work again. You know, today I had a meeting with a couple of my, my heads of department and we're still trying to figure out, can we have town hall or cannot have town hall? You know, everything is, is mm -hmm. different. And it's a frustrating time. Um, and I think as we are moving into this, new era almost phase three it's it's going to be yeah. more frustrating and i think they're going to be watching us the kids are going to be watching us yeah i mean Sanveen, how do you talk about stressful life events with children and young people because you you deal with so many of them in, in your work as a clinical psychologist and you probably get this question a lot but are there tools that um can help children and young people who are experiencing overwhelming emotions cope with them what might be helpful to share in terms of strategies for you know some of the parents or the educators who are listening in yeah i think you know the the one of the things that everyone has talked about, which which I feel uh, personally is one of the most important when talking to children is authenticity. Um, when we're authentic with ourselves and we're authentic with children, they're authentic back 
towards mm -hmm. us. Children, you know, like Sherry said, our kids are watching and, and, and they're, they're excellent at observing mom and dad and knowing if things are going right or not going right, even if we're saying the right words, but you know, they're, they're the experts on your behavior as much as you, you know, you want to like it or not, but they, they're very attuned to the little things that's happening. Um, so specifically during the circuit breaker, one of the things um, that we did more of, and, and, and as clinicians, we do this a lot anyways, um, was checking in, but um, mm -hmm. just being a lot more specific about the checking in. So um, you know, you know, checking in how they're doing, um, understanding, you know, how, what do they understand about COVID? I had um, children that would come into the clinic phase two and their masks on. Um, and they didn't understand why they had masks on. Um, I'm very sure mom and dad had told them many, many times, but it's not just do they understand cognitively why they have a mask on, but emotionally, what, what did that mask mean? What did it mean when they, you know, um, when a three-year-old takes a mask on and rubs their hand and then looks at you, you know, all shocked and, you know, have I done something wrong? Um, I had kids who um, wanted to drink water, but will regurgitate a set of rules that they, that they, you know, you can't drink water, can't take mask off, can't do this, can't do that. And oftentimes that indicated anxiety. Um, so, so as clinicians, it was, um, or even, you know, with, with parents, it was be authentic with your children, have conversations, not a conversation, but multiple conversations, um, letting them know how you feel, letting them know um, that you're open to having this discussion and that it's an unknown time. And um, mm -hmm. when, when, we, when we address that, that it's an unknown time, mommy and daddy also don't know what's going to happen, but we're going to figure it out together. Um, we're gonna we're gonna work through this together. It gives them a sense of control. It gives them a sense of certainty, and and that alleviates anxiety. You know, anxiety breeds on uncertainty. So, as much certainty as we can bring into the lives of children. Um, as everyone was talking, another thought that came to mind, um, which is very close to me, was was the importance of play. Um, children love to play, and play isn't just about blowing off some steam, but it's a way for them to think, for them to resolve conflicts to make sense of emotions. So when given the opportunity to connect with their parents at such a deep level, and that too for an extended period of time, I, you know, I, um, I'd imagine that that was very special for most families, um, parents and, and, and kids as well, because we, we entered their world and we jumped into their world and we helped them make sense in the world, of their world in a way that they understood and in a way that felt comfortable for them. Um, yeah. I can go on about this. <laughs> um, I mean, please do. I mean, when you talk about, um, you know, yeah. parents um, um, becoming more involved in, in the sense of play in, in the home environments, um, do you have parents telling you they would like to do that, but they have no idea how to approach it? Oh, because yeah. I'm hearing that yeah. a lot from my friends. Yeah, yeah. I, I, look, as adults, we forget. Uh, we can learn so much from children. You know, we, we forget the little things. Uh, we forget to be playful. Um, we forget to have fun. We we and um, we 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 struggle to let go. Children let go so beautifully. Mm -hmm. We think about the concept of mindfulness. If we just watch children, we can learn mindfulness instantaneously. Children are extremely mindful. You know, they're playing. They're one hundred percent playing. If they're eating, they're one hundred percent eating. Um, so yeah, I, I think as 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 adults and um, even myself, I used to work with adults before I started working with children years ago. And my biggest learning point at that point transitioning was how do I play? Um, how do I get down on the floor and play, you know, and just be playful without being worried about what to do or how to interact with these toys and just be silly and let the ideas um, come through authentically. I think yeah, I um, yeah. we were once children ourselves. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I totally agree with Sanvin. I, I, I think in a lot of classes, those home-based classes that we have, where you know, it's not just us, uh, you know, engaging the children, but it's also engaging the parents who are beside, mm -hmm. seated beside the children, and and intentionally having to design with their home setting in mind and how do they get to interact, you know, with the children, uh, between amongst themselves, you know, and playing together using toys and and any everyday objects in the home that you can find and just have conversations. Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah I mean, more, I'm sorry. And I would say that it also takes a little bit of stepping out of a comfort zone because if you are talking about digital play, now that's the, the kind of sophistication of the kind of digital games that our children are playing with is something that we ourselves never really play as, uh, played with. Well, as yeah. yeah, that's true. So, so mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a leap of faith to enter into that world and understand the kind of logic of play that they have, the, the different values and decisions that you make. And, and, and that takes a certain 
uh, decision to step out of a comfort zone to engage with the kids. And I think yeah, the kids appreciate that. Yeah. No, and in a respect of just bouncing off what you said, um, that also allows so much connectivity because now our children are teaching us as opposed Absolutely. to us being the authority figures and, and, and they love it, right? Being able to tell you what you're doing, what you're doing wrong, <laughs> how to do that better, yeah. what's the strategy, yeah. And yeah, I, in, in drama I think, term, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, I think for, for, for me, because I, I'm quite a, uh, I mean, I like to play more than my son. And, and <laughs> during, during this period, I'm trying to find activities that I enjoy. Because we don't forget we are parents, we are human or so, no? during, during the, 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 whole, the whole circuit breaker of phase one, phase two, no, the, it's a very, this period is very really terrible. So we, we try, uh, my wife and me, we try to find activities that we, we ourselves, we love, we love to do, like, we like baking, we like cooking. So we get him involved in things that it's okay to mess up the whole kitchen, it's okay to, to play with the flour, and we also eat, he eat, the, he eat the raw eggs and this and then, and then, yeah make noodles and eat everything. So it's, it's okay to do all these things to, to, to get involved. And then I think that, that's, that's important. And of course, uh, my wife and me, we uh, been taught by the, the therapist that, hey, you all need to be a, as, a, as a partner. So every time we say, what, what partner? When we started, when we first started about doing this as a partner for the special needs kids, like, like when he did something good, hey, 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 hey wow, Jinla did something good, you know? Well, and then we say, wow. <laughs> Good job, Jinla. You know, sometimes like, oh, then uh, sometimes my wife will say, "Hey, Bob, wow, uh, hey, Papa, Jinla did something very good. Oh, she do 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 do. Wow, Jinla, you do very good. Oh, wow. Sometimes very quatang they count this because you know, we are bringing up a a, a a kid that I mean, I think until until he's twenty something, thirty something, we'll do the same thing because uh, his his learning ability is different from others. So the, that kind of partner, the working partner as a as a as a husband and wife to to the kids, I think it's very important. It's the same as when you want to work something out, you do a job and then you need your boss to tap your shoulder and say, you did something good. So what we do with the special needs kids, like we must, hey, you do something very good. <laughs> they kind of, kind of way of doing this. I think it's very different, but as a partner, I think it's very important when, when bringing up kids, especially with this, this period of time. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Bob, I, I really love how you shared about helping Jin Le feel safe and empowering him to build resistance. Um, and you found very creative ways of doing that um, during the circuit breaker. Can you share about the sort of, you know, the excursions that you have engineered for Jin Le, you know, the jogging at the park? I'm, I'm not going to spoil this for everyone, but could you take us through that? Because it's so interesting to hear you explain it. So, um. Yeah, actually, we did a, a few different activities with him. One of one of that is uh, we what we're trying to teach him to go out and walk by himself. And because we've been with him twenty four seven, the eyes is always on him. But during this circuit breaker, because the lucky thing is there's not many people and not not many cars in the roads. So we say, how about we try to use this period, ask him to go down by himself. Of course, wife in front, I'm behind. Sometimes I'm in front, sometimes I'm hide behind the tree. Although I'm so big size, right? So I try to hide somewhere. Then until I think about two weeks time, then we 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 made, he he really go out by himself, go down, take a three rounds. Sometimes he will he will look up. Papa, Papa, we are level 15 here from at the level <laughs> one. Look up and Papa, Papa. Okay, he's calling then, we wave to him. Right. And that, that, that routine, and we started from the circuit breaker until today. So that's how he loses his weight. So uh, he will, in the morning, he wake up. Uh, yeah, the other one is my, another photo is a mommy look look down from the from the from the level fifteen. So we make it a routine. Wow. Yeah, this is my wife. Wow. This is the, uh, the, the, the work floor. So we, we we teach him the routine and wake up. In the, he, he will wake up at five thirty every morning. Uh, even school holiday or circuit breaker, he will wake up at five thirty. Five thirty. Ha 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 ha! Laughing. Then breakfast. Say. Then we teach him how to cut the Milo by himself and then pour the three plus one and to the, eat a bread his own bread. After he clean it, he will go come to us, copy, uh, yes, then he will go go down and buy the copy for us, come back, he wears, he will go down with slippers, come back, we wear his socks and then wear his sports shoe to go down to go, go three rounds. So it's the kind of routine, it's very rigid, uh, but 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 the routine becomes his routine, which is a good thing. So we still practice until now every weekend we we'll do the same thing, wake up in the morning, make his own breakfast, go down by himself. That, that's the, that's the one of the activities that we do we go with him is it uh, to us it's a big milestone you know yeah. because to as as, as especially parents that you know, let your son to go down by himself i think that's a, a huge milestone to us uh. and then of course we always take the picture and share with friends and everyone make them ever happy yeah and and another activity is asking him to uh 
because we want to occupy his one hour time because to us it's very tiring to take care of him so we, we try to make him do some writing so say hey how about asking to do calligraphy chinese calligraphy although i don't know how to do chinese calligraphy so i just put a paper ask him to start writing and give him a chinese a heart sutra the sing jing it's very long about mm. 200 to 300 chinese words so he start writing 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 so uh, a very big paper so i said okay this is quite easy so maybe you change a smaller paper so i him to give you a smaller pen so until uh until he, he really master how to write the things uh he can he, from one hour become half an hour so how about let's change a simplified chinese to a traditional chinese so <laughs> he, did, he will write one copy more strokes uh, uh, yeah, yeah more strokes until today uh yeah okay i can show you here um this is what what he saw the so he will write this until today he will do this every day in the morning uh, wow yeah and the, uh, of course, uh, I find my own activities for myself. So I do the, the seal carving. So this also during mm -hmm. the second I pick up the skill that, okay, he, since he writes su such a nice, uh, okay, uh, this is done by him. No, no, I mean, this is done by him. So since he, he, he wrote such, such a nice calligraphy, myself, I, I carve a, a nice seal for him to, for him to chop into it. So I think the whole, the whole circuit breaker, actually we quite enjoyed the circuit breaker, to be honest. Huh? It's like, oh, you can, you can do a lot of activities with him, you can catch up him, and maybe all those things. Yeah. <laughs> so the jogging, the calligraphy practice, the going down to the Kopitiam to get coffee for you and Hui Hui, these are things that um, Jin Le has never done before the circuit yeah, never breaker. Done, never done before the circuit He never go down by himself. Wow. He, he, even when we go out at any any time, he never like 100 meters away from us. He always uh, with us. But during the circuit breaker until today, hey, he can manage like go down and then go walk by himself. Yeah, that's that's something that we really appreciate. La. I mean, from this, <laughs> this, this this period. Yeah, I mean, I mean, they may sound like routines for some families. They might be, but like what you were mentioning, it's 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 such a milestone, you know, for him and for you and Hui Hui as parents as well. I mean, just congratulations. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, and, and then Victor and and Sherry as well. I mean, talking about sort of creating a positive space at home for everybody, you know, the care bubbles. Um, has this period changed the way you think about parenting as well? Um, I think I parent the same. Uh, I don't think it's changed deeply, but I think sure. I, I have changed deeply. So I, I don't know if my methods have changed. Maybe I'm a bit more slack now. I tend to take this like, oh, you know, anything can happen. So let's not plan too far in the future. Um, I was talking to Victor, I think at the previous session, and I said, I, I can't imagine going through PSLE this year. Mm -hmm. uh, we have we have P4 exams coming up and already I'm like, you know what, the, the rules don't, the same rules don't apply. We work hard, sure, but you know, a lot of goalposts for me has has shifted as well. Um, yeah. an interesting thought because I'm I'm gonna write a piece about tiger mommy. To be or not to be a tiger mom. Um, <laughs> and, I, and I think at P4 I have some leeway and I hear my right. friends who have kids in PSL who have Victor Shea after this. It's a very different, I don't know, for me, how I look at school becomes a little bit different. Um, and I think maybe maybe that's probably the biggest change for me like, if I ever had one for parenting. Mm. I mean, what about you, Victor? Anything to add to this discussion? Well, I, I, I would say that when I, you know, sometimes I just, I, I just uh, imagine how would um, our kids remember the time uh, of this circuit breaker? Because it's a memorable time, 2020 uh, pandemic, and, and uh, we were all stuck at home for, uh, for a number of months. And how would they remember this time? And I, and I think it's possible that they may remember it as one of the best time of their life because they get to spend so much time with their loved ones, their father and mother. Yep, all at home all the time, not going anywhere, you know, they, they get yeah. to spend the best yeah. time with, uh, with their parents and, and they, they study together, they play together. And I, I, I think that is something that is um, that's, that's wonderful. Yeah, in terms of the perspective of uh, how our kids will remember the time that we spend. So we may complain, we may whine that you know uh, we want to go back to work or you know to re restore or we want to have a, a to go, to have a sense of normalcy again. But but I mm. do think the kids do appreciate uh, having us around, and I think one of the greatest lessons from this is nothing really beats that quality time that we can spend with our kids. Yeah, I mean, Sanvin, do parents come to you saying that they, you know, they need a bit more help, they need a bit more support because they're spending that much more time with their kids and a lot of this is on them, right? Um, they're sort of looking after, supporting them in, in the schoolwork, but also making sure that home routines are intact, but also making it really positive for the whole family. Um, 
what sort of advice have you been giving parents um, during this time? So with, you know, the, we, we've heard a lot about circuit breaker and, and um, how it's been wonderful for a lot of families, but it's also been very challenging for many mm. um, in, in households where um, there's been limited space or in households yeah. where um, there have been crises and family members, adults in the household have not been at their best. Um, we've seen an increase in domestic violence. We've seen an increase in divorce rates around the world. Um, so I, you know, in, I guess one of the things is, is that we can't discount the, the struggles. Um, yes, parents have been asking for support. They're wearing so many hats. They're, they're wearing the hat of uh, the teacher. They're wearing the hat of an employee. They're wearing their own hat. So, you know, looking out for themselves and their own emotional well-being. And at the same time, wearing the hat of a playmate and, and so many multiple hats that they've had to wear. Um, and we still only have 24 hours in a day. So, our, you know, our mm. days didn't get longer. Um, but our work certainly did. Um, so, again, um, you know, I, I may sound like I'm repeating the same thing, but it was it was self compassion and being authentic to yourself and recognizing that if if you want to help your child, you first have to, to look out for yourself. And if, mm. if you're not at your best, um, and if you're not compassionate, or if you're not going to bring in the same kindness that you want your child to have, or the same sense of um, safety and connectivity and and, and well being, um, it's it's not gonna it's not gonna transfer. So self care first um, mm. before we can we can support our children in in any other way. Yeah, um, yeah. On, on somewhat a related note, Sherry, as part of what you do at the Birthday Collective as an editor, you were also collaborating with our education team on um, this series of conversations called Let's Talk About. And I was wondering whether you could share about um, this initiative because it really encourages parents and educators to unpack some of these complex topics um, with young learners and, and to you know broaden the conversations about discussions like this. Uh, I'll tell you the backstory on how this started with the art science team first. Um, maybe at the very start of Circuit Breaker, we got a call about a uh, migrant worker situation that someone asked us to help out in. Um, and that kind of evolved into a, I mean, other than helping out, there was a encouragement card project that we ended up raising about 10,000 cards uh, mm. for the project. And my, my kids were very deeply involved in it, right? And But because they were deeply involved, they started to ask a lot of very interesting questions and not always comfortable, not always easy, not always um, palatable questions. I, yeah. I felt like I wanted to answer as honestly as I could. I didn't want to sugarcoat the world to them because that doesn't help them in any way. And I realized that, I think the birthday life realized that there were there was a lot of this kind of conversations happening, not just at the adult level, but also with the children at the very young level. Um, the birthday collective, we exist to create a whole space for uncomfortable conversations to have. We started with the adults, um, but also we branched out to ensuring that the children also had a seat at the table. After all, we talk mm -hmm. about the future, right? The future is them and the future is theirs. Um, so they, they should have a seat at the table. But we also realized that we, in order for them to be part of the conversation, we also needed to equip them with the resources to kind of have like information packs, right? On what the, res what the questions are. And so I think it was really lovely for us to come up with these four um, sessions that we did with the Art Science Museum. We talked about LV isolation, we talked about migrant workers, we talked about homes that may have a little bit less than than some others, uh, kind of homes yeah. with crises and, and what that means, because that could be a friend's home, for example. We talked about different kinds of families, because not all families look the same, what families live the same, um, and what does that mean for them. I think the whole idea for us at the Buddha Collective was to talk about the brain trust, right? We, we wanted understanding, not just knowledge. We wanted to build a heart trust. We didn't want just feeling, we wanted connection, we wanted empathy, but also we wanted the hand trust. Um, we don't just want people to do things. We want them to kind of feel like they're advocating for something, whether it's as a very specific cause, maybe a better um, connect uh, communication with old people, for example, to make sure they're not left behind, or perhaps something more broad in, in having us being aware of that their friends could be going through a different time from them. Um, and I think for me, I, I took a lot of cues from my own kids because whenever we, we do these things, um, I mean, I have a 10 and 8-year-old. My 3-year-olds are not really, not quite, but my 10 and 8-year-old for sure have always been part of this conversation and they're my first test bit. Um, and I, I always run through that because I think if they're interested or I can find a way to get them interested in these world issues, these big Singapore issues, um, yeah. I think it will shape not just their today, but it will shape how they think about 
work, think about their friends, think about people, think about how they want to grow up, the kind of Singapore they want to have in the future. Um, and I think when we have them as part of the conversation and we actively include them, sometimes we find very creative solutions. And, and to me, that was that was really interesting um, to be part of and for me, very meaningful, actually. So I think for me, COVID, that was one of the big highlights for us to be part of that series. And I think the kids that we had, I think there was one series in particular or two sessions where we had a lot of children come on to share yeah. about uh, families mm. and things like that. And it was it was, it was really poignant for me. Um, and on a very similar part of the spectrum, Elaine, um, your work at the Learning Connections with your faculty, because you, you work with um, a lot of kids and parents as well, and you use drama as a tool to bring out the significance of play in the day-to-day -to, -day to nurture the whole child. And, and that's, um, you know, one of the philosophy of, of the Learning Connections when you're sharing that with us. And, you know, drama is such an in-person experience. So I'm just wondering how have things been like? on the ground for you and the arts educators. And I know you have some images to share with us as well, and we'll pull them up as you're doing the sharing. Um, yeah, so one of the one of the things that, you know, the reasons why we use drama as, as, as a tool, you know, in our program is really the, the effectiveness of that pedagogy, of that approach that helps us to make connections with human beings, you know. They, they, it's, it's a lot of human connections. So when it's been said that drama is like a rehearsal for life. So whenever we, we, we are in class with the children, we talk about, you know, difficult situations or issues that they have encountered in real life. And how do we invite them to converse and, and discuss those issues, um, problem solve and, and test out different solutions that they have come up with, you know, in yeah. a very safe space that's in the classroom. Yeah. And then, you know, for us to go back to, to, to the discussion point again and say that, hey, you know, um, if we encountered this, you know, and this is what we did, and that was the outcome, is that something that we would like to see? Is that something we would like to go through? If not, then what else? What if this happened? So, so we kind of use a lot of this conversation or dialogic approach, we call it, in the classroom to build relationship, to help them to, to see the interdependency, the interdependent relationship with the others as well. Mm -hmm. um, so when COVID started, where we had to, you know, um, overnight trust and pivot into a online platform. So that was very challenging for us. Um, we were wondering how are we going to do this engagement and, and the live interactions, you know, through the screen um, via Zoom. So there were a lot of challenges. Um, but, you know, the, the teachers were very resilient. So we, we came together, um, you know, when we knew that we had to do online classes, that we could do online classes. The teachers were coming together uh, test, you know, we, we were testing ideas with one wow. another. How does this look? You know, how does this look? And when we do this, you know, what do you see? You know, can you see this? You know, and we, we were kind of testing amongst ourselves as a faculty, various yeah. teaching ideas. And then before we, we, we brought them to the classrooms. And after that, they have tried in the classroom, they will come back to the discussion again and, and, and share about, you know, what worked and what didn't work, what were some of the challenges. So that was interesting. Um, and I guess during the process, it was also for us trying to think how else can we reach out to the children and connect with them, you know? Um, how else can we, you know, tell them that we, 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 we missed you? Mm -hmm. So the teachers actually came up with, you know, together they created a little video and, and for us to send it to the, to, the, to the school, to the parents and say, that, hey, please show your children this and show them how much we miss them. So can we put on the video? Once upon a time, there was a group of drama educators who worked tirelessly for their students. The teachers liked to do all kinds of things with their students, like crawling, dancing, singing, drawing. And every week we would visit the children's preschool castle. 可是有一天,一个又大,又可恶的病毒来到了新加坡! Its name was... Ah, Corona! And people called it... Ah, Coronavirus! He huffed... And he puffed... And he made the whole world sick. The children were locked in their preschool castle. 
and the teachers were very sad because they couldn't visit the children anymore. But thanks to technology, Zoom. 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 The teachers were very happy to see their children again, and the children were happy to see their teachers. Hi, I miss you. Hi, everyone. Oh, I miss all of you. I miss all of you so much, and I hope that all of you are safe, healthy, and continue staying curious and use your imagination. Don't forget it. Stay safe and healthy. Together we can fight COVID-19. Wow, all the warm and fuzzy feels from your faculty. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Um, Talking about pivoting in the pandemic, I mean, you are all leaders in the work that you're doing, um, Victor, in academic research and teaching, Elaine and Bob, you know, you founded our own, own companies, um, and Sherry as well, because you're the founder of Re Re Inc. Training and CCO of Secure Solutions Group, if I'm not wrong. Um, Sandy as you know, clinic manager of Site Connect. Um, has, has this period changed the way you think about your work and your philosophy? Um, what has been really a tough nut to crack in terms of, you know, difficult leadership des um, decisions um, and how are you sort of keeping upbeat and finding new sources of inspiration with your teams, like what Elaine is doing at the, 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 the Learning Connections. Shall we start with Sanveen? Yeah, um, I guess one of the, the biggest uh, barriers for us was therapy always happened um, in a room, you know, we, we were together and, and in um, therapy, we, we think about our therapy space as being a place where yeah. we contain emotions and we contain our clients and um, it's very powerful, that, that space. And as we transitioned away from our rooms, <laughs> which we feel very, very protected over, uh, in, into a, onto a platform where we were interacting with people um, across the screen, um, that, that, was, that was an interesting time, um, having to uh, rethink and relearn how we you know, just like Elaine, how, how we engage our clients. Um, some of our clients are as young as two. So um, having to engage a two-year-old across the screen, um, our art psychotherapists where, again, you know, we're, we, we get into our play, we use clay work, we paint, and it, it is really very much about not just the output, the product that we see, but how our client is engaging with the material that we provide for them. So um, there were many things that we learned, and we learned that, um, you know, therapy needs to be transferable. It needs to be um, uh, empowering. And, and, and in order for it to be all those, um, we need to be able to break away from, from some of the things that we had learned previously, um, break away from our comforts. Um, you know, all of us like to be in a little space and, 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 and we felt almost that the successes that we had were confined to that space and that was that was definitely not the case. Um, and the other thing was um, having to connect with human beings across the screen for eight hours on end. Our sessions are an hour long. So, you know, that that was um, the, the other side of things that we um, had to learn. Um, we couldn't, you know, you can't see the little tweaks and facial expressions across the screen. Sometimes the connectivity was bad. You know, when Starhub went down, that was an awful time for us as clinicians. I think we were all panicking. Um, what are we going to do with our sessions? And I can't hear you turn the camera off. And becoming even more attuned um, to the, the subtle uh, changes in, in tone or um, our client's behaviors. Um, so that that was the, the big learning curve for me. Um, clinical perspective and as a manager I think not to sweat the small stuff and even the big stuff because you know it's, it's it's out of your control mm -hmm. um, so long as everyone is um, well and, and and we're able to do what we can do and we're doing the best that we can that's that's so my biggest takeaway <laughs> sure What's, what about the rest of you then I found that I I haven't seen my colleagues in a long time 
Um, we're, we're making plans to see if we can. We, we do need a town hall. We're very, very delayed in having one this year. Uh, and I'm told we, it's now legit, right? We can have that. Um, I think not being able to see them face to face was is hard. Um, knowing that actually HR has put myself on, I'm supposed to work from home for the rest of the year, or you know until such time where we are truly back to the the, the old normal. Um, so I think that prospect of not having real, I'm not seeing like real life colleagues that sometimes is a bit staggering, makes work a little bit surreal. Um, you know, we we do we do chat a lot more. But I do the one thing that I did find that was a real plus point was meetings are now very 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 efficient um previously we'll start with food you know we'll chat and now like in an hour we're done and what would take normally two hours so i mean that there's some there's some plus points but i, I do miss the human interaction um would anyone else like to chime in on this i, I think there are lost losses and gains in, in the whole process i mean i again i, I imagine what would have happened if uh, the pandemic took place 10 years ago or 20 years ago when we don't have the convenience of the digital technology, the, the advancement of the digital technology to do Zoom. I, I think it will have been a very difficult um, adjustment period for, for us, I think even more so, right? So I think one of the things that I learned uh, and took a little bit more seriously was uh, how to design for online learning experiences for my students. Uh, many a times in the past, we talked about um, digital learning as really plan B. Uh, when I have to do the CISO conference, where I cannot make it, and then I, I, I plan some online learning. But I think in this case, um, through the pandemic, one of the takeaways I, I have really is uh, a greater valuing of um, the, the role of technology in designing different types of learning experiences for our students. So we know that the pandemic, I mean, it's almost a cliche to say now that it has advanced the digitalization efforts. But I think that's one, one, one aspect. I mean, it has lower resistance. People begin to recognize, okay, there's value in it. But I think the more important thing is for us to see, to, to, for, for educators and teachers to expand our repertoire, that we are not just designing uh, physical learning uh, experiences in the classroom, but now we are also able to design um, digital learning experiences. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, perhaps we, we can make a better decision in terms of uh, which experience will be better for the kind of learning outcomes we want for the students. So we can choose uh, between, we can toggle between both rather than to treat digital learning as a plan B for our, for our, our students in the regard. Yeah, um, I, well, we have very little time left and I just wanted to go into my next question, which is um, really looking at, you know, how uh, really hearing about the sort of central feature of your innovation journeys being um, very much about empathy and collaboration and understanding and reflecting the fact that we we have an amazing capacity to come together to problem solve amidst crisis. Um, and another lesson reflected in all the different pieces that you've been talking about as a whole is that well-being matters. Um, so in the current circumstances under which we are all living, how do you yourself practice self-care? I mean, how do you find time when you don't have it? What strategies are you using to replenish your mind and body? Um, how do you care for yourself, but also, you know, turn outward to look after the people around you? Well, I, I have to admit that I wasn't taking very good care of myself initially. You know, working from home ends up working longer hours and the amount of screen time was just overwhelming. Um, I, I went through a period of Zoom fatigue myself, you know, drained physically, mentally, emotionally. I, I was having that frequent headaches. And I'm very aware that my teachers are going through the same as well. So while trying to manage my own fatigue self, I was also trying my best to, to let the teachers know that I'm there for them. But what was really heartening for me was that, you know, they've never failed um, to let us know that they are there for us as well, you know. So they will send us messages to to encourage us, you know, and saying that, hey, we are in this together. We can definitely write through this together. So that togetherness meant a lot to me. Um, and that made me even, you know, miss even more that having to be able to be in the same space with them, you know, like what Sherry, you know, said earlier on, you really miss having that physical connection with, you know, with your with your team of people. Yes, and then what about you? I mean, your work really aims to relieve the stress and improve psychological well-being. But but what is it like to be um, looking after yourself and practicing self-care during this period? Yeah, um, balancing work and life, um, knowing when to stop. That was one of the things that I, I took away. I found myself 
uh, working through public holidays because, you know, what am I going to do with Sunday or Monday or Thursday? Every day felt like the same. Um, but I did little things. I took up painting. It's something that I thought about for a long while. Uh, so do paint by numbers. Um, just little fun things. Nothing, you know, I think when we were initially talking, I, I, I didn't have the time to do the um, wonderful, everyone seemed to be on a cooking expedition and baking. If anything, that sounded a little too exhausting for me and it was stressful to see those photographs and then I'm meeting Maggie and everyone has got these wonderful meals that they're having at home. Um, but it was little things, you know, what can I get joy from? Um, connecting with nature, that was very nice. Um, it, just whatever you can do in, in, in little bits and bobs. That was that was what I did. Yeah, I mean, Bob. Apart from making noodles, <laughs> what else? Are, what else are you up to? Uh, okay. In fact, uh, during that period, uh, uh, I was working throughout the whole the whole few months uh, because I'm uh, shooting for a government agency to record the circuit breaker. So I went to go to hospital to shoot the the nurses and doctors and uh, work and then foreign workers and these things. So uh, to be. I'm, I'm considered lucky that I still can be able to go out and go around to do some shooting. And of course, my wife is the one, the only one who stay at home with my son and really the 24 hours, 24-7. Uh, of course, um, when, when, when I, I'm going to try to cut down my shooting and then come back home and then make sure that I'm clean and thing. And when, when, I'm, when I'm at home, uh, like, like, like I mentioned before, then I'll try to, beside teaching shit, uh, things that he need to learn, but we're trying to find things that we enjoy and then make him involved instead of we involved to his, 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 his things. And, and of course, during the whole period, we actually, we, oh, my wife and me, we finished two Chinese drama that are about 78 episodes or 90 episodes. <laughs> so like, that's our me time, our time. So Jinle, you go to your room, don't come out. So we let him stay in his own room, do his own, he want to do. Uh, read books or play iPhone. Okay, okay, you can have IT time. Okay, but you give me my time, so we will end up show eating our apples. Uh. So yeah, I think I think balance. There's no, I think there's no such thing as work, work life balance. Uh. I mean, I've been freelancing for ten years. I've been working every day, every every public holiday, every day, every moment. At night when I'm sleeping, I'm still thinking about money. <laughs> so there's no there's no such thing as work life balance. But we need to find something that we really enjoy. I, I, as a parents, we need to find activities that we enjoy, can release our own, own stress, get, get your kids to involve, not, not be involved in this. I always tell my, my son, I am the boss, you are not the boss, okay? <laughs> I control the remote control, the TV remote control, I control, not you, okay? No, <laughs> <laughs> That's very important. Wow. <laughs> okay. I mean, we've got one question from Emma who's listening in. Um, and I would like to extend this question to anyone who feels like um, they want to contribute. So Emma is, Emma is asking if a similar situation with, you know, circuit breaker happens again and we're all in lockdown because of some outbreak, um, what will be one definite thing you do with your family? Um, or what is one thing that you do differently um, because you've you know taken some lessons from it? Maybe I'll try to respond to that. I, I, I will address the second uh, question. What is one thing that I will do differently? Because um, as I reflect on the, the past few months, I, I guess it was also that survival instinct that, that kicked in. And, and so we try our best to look after our families, ourselves. But I think one of the things that... Um, has been um, surfaced through through what uh, Sabine and Sherry has mentioned today as well. There's a lot more stories. Is that um, people, there are different families that are experiencing COVID um, very differently. Uh, and I think one of the things that we would do differently would be to um, look, to be more intentional in looking beyond ourselves um, and, and to look out for the, the other families that may have their own struggles and issues as well. So, so I think that would be something that I would do. Anyone else who would like to share as well? I like to think that if this happened again, we'll be, we'll be ready. I mean, I, that's, that's what I'm banking on. Um, I, I told my kids that I think we should be prepared that circuit breaker will happen again. Um, may not be now, but you know, they, they just unearth some bacteria from the Jurassic age, right? So who knows? Um, I think it's, it's, a, it's an eventuality or it's a possibility that we now know could happen. Um, and I think it's now in their, my children's repertoire of experience. And I think, I, I, I'm hoping the second time round they'll be a bit more self-sufficient and it won't be such a big shock to them. So, I, I mean, I'm, per, I'm personally fingers crossed that it doesn't happen again. But if it does, you know, I think, I think we'll be okay. We'll be okay. 
I agree. I, I tell my team the same thing. Um, with you know, because there's always question of what's tomorrow going to be like, and 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 mm. um, it's let's just focus on the here and now. And we've got through. I think we got through the hardest time. And if we were to be thrown back, I think um, the resilience will kick back in. And 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 I'm pretty sure each one of us will find our own rhythm. And um, it definitely, I think, will be less. And I'm hoping. Yeah, maybe I shouldn't say I. I <laughs> will. I'm hoping it'll be less stressful um, this time round. Yeah. That's an expectation now that I think of it. That's that's the anxiety. There you go. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, time. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, I think the same, same as um, what you all have shared. I think is we, we are, I think we are quite, I mean, most, most, most of people can read it for, for, for the second, second of, I mean, if a second is something coming back again, we are, we are read it. And then, yeah. um, but as a, as a, a business owner, I mean, I have my own company and then, a lot, a lot of photographers and videographers will say that the market is very bad during this this period. There's no more, no more shoot and all these things. I said, I mean, uh, some of them are just sure it's okay. It's just not just you. The whole market is dropped, so everyone starts from zero. So it's not like compare like different sector with sector. sector. It's a whole sector. We're gonna go down. Let's go. Let's start from zero. Then drop the same bar. Let's start doing it again. It's okay, you know. Be positive. Oh, my, 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 no. When 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 oh, I learn from my son when. When, when he his his anxiety will say say come say come come down come down and then sometime when when I'm angry before I scold him he will say come down I say who Papa <laughs> breathe in <sighs> breathe in three times so who come down no he come down he ask Papa come down so Papa need to come down before I scold him so I think we need to learn to come down and, and enjoy the every yeah, that's very important. Yeah, I guess with my team, you know, I mean, we, we've all gone through since uh, February this year, all the happenings and all the different kinds of events. Uh, I mean, we, I, you know, I've always been sharing with them that, you know, despite the fact that COVID has slowed us down, but it, it's, it has not stopped our creative thinking, you know, we continue to think creatively, we continue, we, we continue to create new things. And we, a lot of things we were talking about in the pipeline were kind of accelerated, you know, um, to this state, you know, to do to, to today that we, we 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 can do it now. We don't have to wait till later. And now that we've experimented both um, online and and physical settings, we know that we can do a lot more things. Um, at home, I'm just you know I'm just really enjoying the time with you know spending time with my girls, and and you know they they were the one that taught me all about social media, how to go on Instagram, how to do Facebook stuff, and and TikTok I think, yeah. And and you know, starting, you know, they 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 see me hiding, you know, in the room working the whole day, they will drag me out and say, We need we need to do exercise together. So do a TikTok dance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They they yeah, they got me to do a TikTok video. <laughs> I, I think yeah, I, mean, I think um, I, so I think if this happens again, we should learn from Chin Le because Chin Le clearly learned three things that I've discovered today. He learned new things. He managed his parents, the people around him, and then he will say, "My people, SG." <laughs> That's the mindset that we all need. <laughs> hey, Chin Le, <laughs> he's running now. I think I heard him say, <laughs> And I can lose yeah. weight some more. Best. <laughs> <laughs> he's our role model. <laughs> I mean, times of crisis have historically also been opportunities for change, and and this sort of global timeout, like what of you, what all of you have been sharing, has been offering us the chance to reflect on, you know, who we are as a society, what is the best version of ourselves as people, um, as a parent, as an educator, um, and to the society at large. And you've all been sharing about some of the opportunities, you know, offered by this collective experience and what we can learn moving forward. So I'd just like to close this program and extend the note of contemplation um, with this question. If you could describe in one word your hope for how we will be putting back and rebuilding the world around us, what would this word be for you? I can start. Um, compassion. Thank you, Sanvin. Bob, what about you? Oh, the <laughs> Okay, maybe we can come back to you later if, yeah. if you want. Um, Sherry, what about you? What's the one word for you? Grace. Elaine? Imagination. Victor? Value. I think we learn to value. Mm. I think to me, it's creativity. I think um, because we, we, 
because of this 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 COVID, I mean, we change the things that we need to do. So the creativity from from the parents or from from any I say for, for our parents, we need to change our routine, find a new activities for him, do a new things, uh, do other uh, new things that uh, new challenge. Uh, I think creativity is important as well. Yeah, well, there is so much um, ambiguity as to how this whole situation will continue to evolve. I think what all of you have shared today is really evidence of you know, our ability to reconstruct a new sense of normal and rearrange our lives to respond to a shifting landscape of novel and emerging priorities. So thank you so much, um, Sherry, Sandrine, Elaine, Victor and Bob, for making time to take part in what has been uh, such a nourishing conversation. And it's been really wonderful getting the chance to talk to you about um, what all of your roadmaps to pandemic resilience um, are like. Um, and, and I wish you all the best with family and work. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, and to all of you who have been with us this afternoon, we love having you join us and we really appreciate um, the question, comments that have come our way throughout the discussion. And if you'd like to access more content that we have been publishing, like the Let's Talk About series that we were mentioning earlier, please head over to um, Art Science Museum's YouTube channel where our Art Science at Home programs are available for public access. And do look out for more upcoming events on our website and Facebook page as well. Um, most importantly, please continue to stay safe and keep well. And we hope to see all of you soon at our next program or at the museum. Thank you so much to all of you panelists again. Have a good um, have a good afternoon and the rest of the day. Bye. Bye. <laughs>